This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us. With me today is Richard Fields and John Cameron. Thank you guys for joining us today. You know, no, thank we'll, you for having me. Hey, yeah. we'll, we'll jump right in. The GOP believes the Democrats are giving them a winning strategy for 2022. This... Uh, I'm not entirely sure what they're thinking of because they don't have a strategy for 2022, it appears. Just not being Democrats doesn't seem to be a winning strategy for me. But what do you guys think about this? Well, not being a Democrat might be enough. Uh, of course, they're, they're politicizing it and taking the wrong side of, of some of the issues uh, and you know, just saying we are Democrats, namely immigration. And uh, Republicans going after you know being a you know, border wall and a nativist and and all of that. That's going to it might help them in the short run in 2022, but in the long run, uh, we're already a majority a minority majority uh, can, uh, state here in California and the country. Regardless of what kind of uh, draconian immigration controls uh, take place, we're going to turn into a minority majority uh, country uh, in not in not too long a time. And uh, if the Republicans are the people who oppose uh, immigration and, 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 in essence, oppose minorities having a voice in government, it's going to come back and bite them over the, over the long run. But in the short run, hey, it's a, you know, it's a popular issue among the, uh, among the rednecks. As far as uh, uh, infrastructure, the infrastructure bill, and I say so-called infrastructure bill, because 80 90 percent of it is just Democratic wish list uh, stuff like uh, long-term uh, care for uh, work, long-term care workers funding, uh, climate change uh, boondoggles, uh, family care, all, all of that kind of stuff. Those are things that the Republicans uh, are not in favor of, and that the Democrats are. And if they're if that's rammed through in the two years that Democrats have a slim majority, that will come back to bite them. You know, I I. Uh beg to differ with with Richard on a couple of points that that and and I I didn't drill down on the polls but uh, prior to the last uh, election um, some people said well after the last election when um, even though the total number was still small the percentage increase in black um, um, males voting for Trump was pretty significant even though the sample size is probably, you know, it's it's still a rather insignificant slice. And people who, who talked to uh, folks and asked them why, you know, as a black person, why would you vote for this racist Trump said, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, all those illegals coming over the border are taking jobs that young black men could have. So um, there's a, there's a strange, uh, amount of support from an, a a uh, a part of the demographic that's you know typically voted like ninety percent Democrat, and uh, then um, so so that's kind of counterbalances the the and I I agree it's wrong the strategy of of you know closed borders and you know fear and all the rest of that but uh, you know basically it found. Uh, um, uh, eager ears, supposedly in, uh, in uh, I thought there was only going to be three guests on the show. Uh, found eager ears in in uh, you know black males, but I don't know if those numbers are right. And you know it was out of the popular media, and I think those people just sit around smoking dope and make stuff up. Whereas when I sit around smoking dope, I try to drill down into the truth. Just kidding, folks. Um, so I think that that's that's part of it. The uh, you know, I'm um, Richard. You brought up something on one of the other shows that that uh, you know Biden's popular because he gave money away, and it looks like the the information that I read in, in some of the research I did says you know his popularity is pretty strong. But then again, it'd be really hard for us to get good numbers out of lamestream press because it's like 95 percent supportive of whatever you know that section of the political class is doing the the uh, socialist part so they, they yeah but I mean, all of this stuff. we're looking at uh, a 59 percent approval rating for biden by the pew research now uh, without question pew is left of center and yeah. is going to structure their survey in such a way that it would be favorable 
uh, to Democrats and Biden in particular. But 59 percent is pretty stout uh, this early in the administration. And mm. uh, I, I attribute most of that to the fact that people like free money and yeah. figure that there's uh, an endless supply of it, mistakenly, of course. Uh, but, the, the, you know, it, it's it's it, in the short run, it's, it's a winning uh, position to give money away. Long yeah. run, it's disastrous. Short run, hey, I like it. Well, and also well, in the short run, we have to remember that we no longer have Trump to kick around. And so I think people, are, there's a certain segment of the population that's simply happy we don't have to hear Trump's name all the dang time. And I think, you know, they're certainly happy that Biden's there because they don't have to hear Trump. And that makes a certain amount of people happy. Policy doesn't matter for a lot of people. They just, it's their emotions. And as long as that emotion isn't being fed, they're going to be happy. But yeah, the, the Republicans, you know, bringing up Trump, the Republicans have another problem, which is, uh, a, a significant uh, percentage of Republicans can't stand Trump uh, for good reason. And, uh, and another significant percentage of Republicans can't stand anybody that doesn't like Trump. Uh, and, you know, the, the Republican war has got a, a simmering civil war going on within it as to whether or not to uh, uh, be accepting and, and uh, uh, supportive of, 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 uh, of Trump talking points. And, and Trump as a personality going forward in the pot in the party. Yeah, as soon yeah. as someone's reasonable can actually re get that that Trump support is really just an anti-establishment populist Republican perspective, and they can feed that they can get past this Trump thing. But I don't know if there's anybody in the, on the Republican side who's willing to actually do that. Well, I think that, and also uh, I think. In, in order to, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people out there that are uh, anti-Trump enough to go with, with Biden. I mean, not in the Republican Party, very many in the Republican Party as well, because, you know, I work for a nonprofit and um, that was, you know, conservative slash libertarian. And, uh, you know, a, a ton of those people didn't give any money at all to Trump. Uh, but after he was elected, uh, they, they, they got behind, the, they got behind, uh, you know, the fact that he wasn't a socialist. So, you know, they changed allegiance. I, I, I think in order to capture what, what you call the middle or people who, who would, you know, I mean, adopt maybe some Tea Party kind of ideas, you got get, you got rid of got to get rid of Trump because he's not actually really a classical Republican, and which is, you know, he is in one respect strong military, but as far as fiscal responsibility goes, he's a nut. And you know, protectionism, trade, uh, deficit spending, all the rest of that. If you want to capture people out there, all over the political spectrum, that uh, you know, kind of want us to have a balanced budget and not. Uh, you know, explode our economy and, and have fiat currency and all the rest of that. And I think there are a lot of them out there. Then, you know, the, the Trump core isn't going to be where those people go to. And as long as Trump's there, people who would maybe align with Goldwater type Republicans aren't going to align, even if they're not in the party. Well, and, and of course, the wild card is Justin, Justin Amash. Justin Amash uh, made a... Uh, uh, a token effort to win the Libertarian Party nomination in 2016 pulled out when it looked like the uh, the hardcore Libertarians weren't going to buy into his uh, late arrival in in, in the uh, state uh, caucusing. But he's uh, being very active on social media, being very active going to Libertarian Party uh, conventions and events and so forth. Uh, so he, I think, is uh, at least now positioning himself for uh, a 2000. Uh, uh, 20, uh, 24, uh, uh, whatever the next uh, presidential election, yeah, 2024, run for president as a libertarian. And that could really uh, toss a, uh, a hand grenade into the uh, uh, idea of uh, 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 a, uh, 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 Republicans being able to take control versus Democrats being able to take control in 2024. 2022 does look fairly decent for uh, Republicans simply based on the fact that the uh, party that wins the presidential election almost always loses seats uh, in the following uh, two-year uh, congressional mm -hmm. election. And the, the, the margins are razor thin as it is. 
Yeah. Well, so we're going to move on. But this actually brings up, John Stamash brings up an interesting question. There was an article out from an economics professor out of Caracas discussing <laughs> out of, yeah, this is out of Caracas discussing the the, the cancer of a, of totalitarian totalitarian censorship in the United States of all places. It is, <laughs> but his his point was that you know there's a couple of ways to get to this totalitarian perspective, and it's one is kind of the Soviet Union. Venezuela way, and the other way is this self censorship cancel culture that the United States is headed down. And the fact that someone from Caracas is pointing this out, I think, is humorous to say the least. Well, yeah, it is humorous, and it's it's interesting. Uh, censorship in the uh, Soviet style, the, the the you know the hardcore communist style, is government censorship, pure and simple. It's the government saying. Uh, what you can and cannot say, what can what can be broadcast, what can't, what can uh, see a, a printer's ink, and what cannot. But uh, social or uh, censorship, fascist style, is something entirely different. That's where the government and large corporations collude to decide what can and cannot be said. And that's kind of what we're, where we're going in the United States. We're having we have a, a very unhealthy uh, uh, relationship between the major. Uh, uh, the major uh, social media platforms, uh, the, the people who uh, stand at, who are gatekeepers for the internet and the government. And the reason for that unhealthy relationship is most of those companies are being overtly, if not covertly, threatened by the federal government for higher, more uh, onerous regulation if they don't comply with whatever the government wants them to say. And so they're complying. They're uh, coming down, you know, large corporations are coming down against the uh, the voting law change in, in Georgia. And if you take a real close look at the voting law change in Georgia, it's not all that onerous. Uh, it's being uh, portrayed as racist and, you know, the worst thing since uh, uh, Hades, the devil escaped Hades, but it, it's in fact relatively benign. Uh, but the corporate media is behind it. And so we have uh, a fascist relationship, really, between media, uh, particularly social media, not to mention the mainstream media, and the government. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the lamestream media, uh, because I think, you know, an awful lot of people do get uh, all of their their ideas from social media, and they follow social media a lot. But there's still a, a huge section of the United States of America, um, which, uh, you know, that, that maybe is a subject for another show, the, the, the fact that we are a United States rather than, you know, a, a different form of government. And they, they do get, they, they get uh, their political bias from the news they watch on television, they get it from the radio they listen to, they get it from late night talk shows and all the rest of that. And, and if any of you have, have bothered to look at uh, lamestream media television, much less read ma lamestream media uh, newspapers, which some people still read, I guess, um, the bias is, is huge. The shows have uh, woke mentality and political messaging built into them to the point where they're almost unwatchable, whether it's a drama or a comedy. For the most part, there are some standouts. So... The, the message that's out there from all media, other, th other than some rare exceptions, and I would say, uh, you know, Richard, you're for fortunate enough to leave, live in an area where there's one exception, um, is it's, it's, it's massive, it's obvious, it's in lockstep. I'm, and I, I remember after the, uh, what do they call it now, the insurrection on January 6th, where uh, nobody died from violence, and there was well, one or two, one or two did, but yeah. well, not not from not from violent activity. There were these; they were all medical. They were all the people died from medical causes, and and they basically uh, are not releasing the the one cop that died. You know, uh, they're not releasing any of the results from um, the coroner's report because. It will show he didn't die from violence, but anyway, and and they're they're, but within minutes of that happening, the reporting across the spectrum all used the same uh, buzzwords. It was white insurrection, 
racist, nationalist, white, insurrection, da 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 da. And it became the, the common speak across all media platforms all over the country within seconds. And, uh, you know, I would, there, I don't think there's any central uh, wizard behind the curtain pulling the levers. I think they're just all in the same mindset and they all woke and they realize what woke is and they adopt it. And it's, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. Well, they all follow the lead of primarily the New York Times and secondarily the Washington Post. If it's in the New York Times, uh, it's going to be on AP. It's going to be the front page story on the New York Times today is the, you know, is also the front page story on most of the uh, newspapers across the country because that's where they take their cue because most newspapers, not to mention TV stations, don't do a whole lot of uh, original reporting. They don't have the staff or the revenue to support hiring their own reporters. They don't have their own Washington Bureau anymore. They rely on the New York Times, the Washington Post, AP, uh, and to a lesser extent Reuters to get all of their uh, national or international news. And they do a relatively poor job just even on local reporting. Uh, mm. They just don't have the staff to, uh, mm. because you know newspapers are a dying breed and local uh, television stations are following quick, quickly and radio stations mm. as well following quickly uh, in their footsteps. Mm. Can, and that brings up another question. I don't know if you guys listen to, to radio, uh, like commercial radio, whether it's AM or FM. But uh, i am noticed as I listen to FM stations, I, I go through the local rock, whether it's alternative or classic rock or whatever stations, that a, a huge chunk of commercial messaging is being paid for by orgs that are dot .orgs that are government-funded. It's... Uh, you know, don't don't park your car in the train tracks. Secondhand smoke will kill you. Um, it's actually not paid for. That's actually public service announcements for yeah. the most part. And the radio stations uh, do it. Uh, it's, it's free. They they do it gratis. They're well, so so that that if that's the case, it means they don't have any paid ads because the the uh, just about every spot I'm listening to is that. But I mm -hmm. I think a lot of the stuff that that comes out from the state of California is actually paid for. I could be wrong. Some is. Terrestrial radio and terrestrial TV, not to mention uh, ink soakers, are dinosaurs. Yeah. Yes, yeah. well, they're dinosaurs because of their own actions. They've actually... No, they've, well, not, not necessarily. Yeah. They're dinosaurs because the Internet does a heck of a lot better, uh, immediate, uh, more tailored job of presenting news. Mm. That, you know, that's well, presenting its own problems, but it's, you know, they can't compete with the Internet. Well, they gave away, they gave up local news at the one time when the one difference between news, local newspapers and local TV stations between them and the internet is the ability to give us local news. They kind of gave it up. It's essentially they did what Sears did. It's, Sears gave up their, their catalog right at the time the internet came along, but they didn't move to the internet. They just gave up the catalog. <laughs> and so the, the news media is essentially doing the same thing. They've all gone this whole, hardcore left and anybody who's not hardcore left you don't even have to be right you just have to be not hardcore left has turned it off and so they've got this shrinking this ever increasing shrinking ever decreasing <laughs> viewer base and then they're wondering why it's just it, it boggles my mind that they haven't understood that you know if they actually told people what happened on the streets like explain what's going on to the local development you know, whether the rail yards here in Sacramento or Aggie Square, none of that's covered locally. And so, if have, they, so if they told us about this, maybe more people would actually watch them and listen to them and buy the newspaper. The newspaper doesn't do me any good. So why would I buy it? It doesn't tell then, me anything. Uh, to, to pile on to your point about local news, there are still some small town papers that are doing extraordinarily well. And it's because they focused completely and totally on uh, local news. I mean, they'll have some national news there, but they figure people can get national news somewhere else. Uh, they'll, you know, have some sports reporting that, you know, everybody has allegiance to the nearest, typically the nearest professional baseball, football, and basketball team in some areas of the country, soccer. But everything else is the PTA meeting with lots of pictures. It's the uh, the volunteer organization with lots of pictures. Uh, it's the, the moose, the elks, the, um, the on and on and on and on. Lots of names, lots of pictures, completely local, and they are, are making money. 
I'm not saying they're... Oh, yeah, and, 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 the, and the local police beat with, you know, with all the, yeah, the arrests local police from, report. You know, for yeah. minor yeah. stuff. Well, yeah, and, and, and those work, and you're absolutely right, James, when, when newspapers gave up local uh, and, and started just, you know, downloading uh, pre wire stories, uh, they lost their whole... But what really killed them was Craigslist. And because the, 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 the profit in newspapers was all out of classifieds. It looked like it came from the big flashy display ads, but the actual profit, the, 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 the revenue per page and classified advertising, which was automotive, real estate, and employment, was where the dollars came from. And they dropped right to the bottom line. And when Craigslist pulled all of the local classified advertising out of those newspapers, they went upside down. And they could never, they never return. It's not, it wasn't Google, it was Craigslist. So, well, I like to point know. out the gig economy could have saved them. They could have transferred to gig style of, uh, reporters, but their union contract simply wouldn't allow it. And they were inflexible and inflexible corporations, inflexible organizations mm -hmm. have a tendency to die out. That's just yeah. kind of what they do. Well, speaking of dying out, we're going to go come move on here in the last few minutes. Riots at the Capitol were bad on January 6th. We all kind of acknowledged that, that having riots is bad, violence is bad. Except now this last weekend, um, Maxine Waters apparently was caught telling Black Lives Matter protesters to get more confrontational in their rioting. I'm not entirely sure what message our leaders are trying to send. Is riots bad? Well, that's the message they're trying to send is if you're rioting for the right thing, that's fine. That's, that's righteous. If you're rioting for the wrong thing, forget about it. Since when did violence be, be bad not be a universal thing? Committing acts of violence, know, it, destroying violence things. And violence in favor of the, it's, you know, it's the, the old, uh, old saw, uh, the, you know, violence in favor of a righteous cause is fine. Uh, you know, the ends justify the means. That's the philosophy that's being expressed there. If the ends are right, we don't care about the means. Now, as libertarians, that's uh, anathema to us. The ends don't justify the means. But in uh, popular uh, politics, both left and right, Democrat and Republican, the ends justify the means. That's why Maxine Waters can condone uh, rioting in the streets. It's why uh, Republicans can condone uh, uh, civil asset forfeiture and uh, putting people who try to cross the border to have a better life in cages. Yeah, this, this, this notion that we can have riots one spot and it's fine. It's, I don't even necessarily find it's this violence. This notion, I don't even trust myself to make that the choice when it's okay. When, when is violence become an acceptable use for when does violence become acceptable? The only time violence is acceptable is in self defense, self -defense. and it's very seldom yeah. is that the, is that the situation. Most times, yeah. most forms of violence are, are uh, you know, uh, are offensive, not, not defensive. Yeah, I, I want to. I kind of want to drill down a little bit on this whole Maxine Waters thing because um, you know, inciting to riot is is actually a crime. And and if you're uh, if you're telling people to uh, get more confrontational, um, I, I think you know, should you use the word violence? Somebody could have probably you know filed a suit against her. Uh, but uh, you know, get more confrontational has enough leeway in it to where. Uh, you know, maybe it's not inciting to riot. And, but isn't that clearer um, than what Trump said on the sixth? That, that that's more a clear a clear call to violence than what Trump said on the sixth. Well, it's Trump. absolutely a more clear call to, to violence than what Trump said uh, on the sixth. Uh, you know, Trump said uh, whether he meant it or not. Uh, let's let's keep this peaceful. Uh, just let your let your opinions be known. We want to make sure this is peace, peaceful because of our brothers in blue, that we respect the law, and da 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 But so I absolutely agree that that uh, we have, as Richard accurately pointed out, uh, a double standard here. And and you know the 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 Black Lives Matter organization is is disgusting. The idea that Black Lives Matter is a wonderful thing. The the un, the Black Lives Matter org is is a socialist mass that that uh, promulgates the idea that nuclear families are wrong and da -da 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 -da, just crazy but the idea that cops shouldn't shoot black people is is absolutely necessary to be front page news and i absolutely agree but 
when you, uh, you know, anytime you start burning, you know, uh, people's property down and, and, and killing more people in those riots than were by far, than were ever shot by a cop, it, it even people whose IQ is pretty darn low are going to feel some dissonance there and they're going to lose some support. Um, so, you know, I think these, the, you know, people like Maxine Waters, she's way outlived her usefulness if she ever had any in Congress. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's doing, she's doing way more harm to, to what's actually a good cause than, than good. And, and I wish she'd just shut up. The, yeah, I mean, the, the, the sad part of the whole thing is we're turning into a garrison state. We're turning into a, a country where the, the police are not uh, guardians but warriors. We're turning into a country where we have a barbed wire fence around courthouses in order to uh, protect the uh, supposed enforcers of the law and the judiciary, uh, those who educate the law. Uh, we're turning into a place where the capital is surrounded by uh, barriers and, and, uh, and barbed wire and so forth, you know, we're, we're turning into uh, what looks like a third world dictatorship. And I'm wondering if the looks are accurate of reality. Well, you actually yeah, I, say that. I think I, they are. Well, I, you say that. I, I read a, I saw a uh, podcast from a guy from the, the actual third world. And he said he went to Portland and he said Portland reminded him of a third world country. Just with all the Antifa activity in the last year, couple of years, the downtown Portland is starting. He says reminded him of a third world country. Yeah, and we have to be careful. We have to be careful not to not to lay all the blame on Antifa. Just like we need to be careful not to lay all the uh, the blame on Proud Boys and and you know the uh, insurrectionists on the right. We have to lay the blame where it belongs on people who believe that violence is an acceptable means to achieving their ends, whether their ends are Black Lives Matter or whether their ends are no immigration or whether their end, whatever their ends are. Violence is not an acceptable form of uh, protest or getting your way. It's uh, the opposite of having a dialogue and a discussion and a negotiation. Yeah, and I just have to point out that um, the people we should actually be blaming are those politicians and profiteers who feed off of it. You know, the average person, you, we call them what they call them, the useful idiots. You know, I don't want to be calling them necessarily use, idiots, but, you know, they're useful uh, cannon fodder, essentially, for the political class. You can't really blame people for being frustrated. We have a, a country where the Federal Reserve is purposefully making interest rates at zero so that savers cannot get a return on their saver on their savings so that they are facing retirement as paupers. We're looking at a country where uh, it's impossible to make as much money on, on, as a percentage of uh, the national income. Now it is way lower. The, the, the 90% or the 99% make lower a lower percentage of the uh, national income now than they did 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, and that's, a, that's a re also a result of uh, Federal Reserve policy that funnels new money toward the uh, elites toward the one percent, toward the uh, you know the, the people who control corporations and banks and so forth. There's a whole lot of frustration that is justified frustration. People just don't realize the cause of the evils that beset us, and those causes are largely government causes, uh, or more precisely, government colluding with business uh, causes. Well, hopefully that Fed printer ends printing soon, but we are out of time. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here, and we will see you guys next week. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m., Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.